Hello everyone, what's up? In this Star Wars Legion painting tutorial, I'll show you how I painted and weathered this NR-N99 droid, also known as the Snail Tank. More specifically, I will cover the process in 7 parts. Part 1, Priming. Part 2, Metallic Undercoat. Part 3, Base Coat and Chipping. Part 4, Accent Colors. Part 5, Pin Wash and Tracks. Part 6, Pigments. And Part 7, Finishing Touches. Towards the end, I will also share my conclusions about this build and about the model itself. This video is divided into chapters, so you can more easily review particular techniques if you like. Let's get started, shall we? The primer that I chose this time is AK Black Primer with Microfiller, which although highly toxic, is my weapon of choice when I know that I'm going to subject a model to a lot of abuse. As you can see, I decided to tackle this model in sub-assemblies, which I had literally never done before. In order to hold the components in place while spraying, I used double-sided tape on thick stock paper for some and clamps for others. As always, I went with a thin mist first, gradually increasing the opacity with successive light coats. With a lacquer-based primer, you could say that this is not really a requirement, but it has become second nature for me and it does help with paint adherence. By the way, if you want to replicate these steps but you don't have access to an airbrush, a booth and a respirator, I would recommend a rattle can primer instead, like the Army Painter ones for example. Those primers are lacquers as well and will also provide you with a tough finish. Anyway, when I was done, I was very happy with the results. Everything had a nice, even coat of primer. In preparation for the next stages, I let everything dry for a full 24 hours. It should come as no surprise that I chose AK Extreme Metals for this step. If you've seen any of my videos this year, you will know that this enamel-based paint range is one of the staples of my diet. Figuratively speaking, of course, I do not recommend drinking enamel paints. As you will see, getting a really good metallic finish with this paint is really child's play. I still apply it in successive thin coats, but this paint is so forgiving that there is little that can actually go wrong. The metallic flakes are really fine and coverage is really good despite the primer that we applied being absolutely matte. If you want to ensure an even more realistic finish, just apply it over a satin or gloss black instead. About a month ago I had this idea of using tongue depressors with double-sided tape in order to prime some small models. This also worked great to hold the tracks as you can see here. Here you can appreciate even better what I was saying before about this paint. Check out this easy, gradual transformation from grainy matte black to shiny metals. All I'm doing in terms of airbrush technique is making sure that I keep the brush in motion and going easy on the trigger. This cogwheel is another good example. That took longer because of all the recesses, but it also came out great. I was very happy with all the metals, but would all this extra work with the sub-assemblies really pay off? That remained to be seen. The first step here was a pretty heavy coat of chipping fluid. If any of it got under my masking, that would actually help with any subsequent black overspray, so there was no need to be terribly conservative. Since this product is entirely transparent, I don't think there is much to show here, so let's just skip ahead. For the black base coat, I chose Tamiya LP5, same as for my recent dwarf spider droid. However, I made a significant mistake at this stage. I didn't realize that the paint in this particular LP5 pot had already been thinned before. I started spraying it and I was very surprised to see that, well, it was just like my post-shading mix. To make things worse, this was my very last pot. So I just decided on the fly to roll with it and see whether I could get complete opacity somehow. Since my priority was finishing the project to get the video out to you, waiting for another pot of paint to arrive 
would really be like a spanner in the works. In the end, thankfully, this proved not to be an insurmountable obstacle. It took me ages to get the black to be opaque, but I was happy enough with the finish in the end. Now for the really fun part, chipping effects. Before I take the model under the knife, or in this case the needle, I apply a liberal amount of water to the area to be chipped. As you can see, I'm concentrating on panel lines and surface details. The reason the paint seems to repel the water, by the way, is that LP5 is a semi-gloss black paint. I then took my old airbrush needle out and used a tip to reveal the metal undercoat along those panel lines. This kind of reverse edge highlighting will not only create a lot of contrast, but it also fits the narrative that I have chosen for my army. I then go back in with the brush and essentially enlarge existing chips. Of course, this is entirely optional and will depend on how extreme you want the effect to be. As you can see, this variation of mine on the old hairspray chipping technique is eminently controllable, even for a big klutz like me. So if you have a model with clear panel lines, like most Star Wars vehicles are, I would invite you to give this a try. It's more like using a pencil perhaps than anything else. You'd be surprised at how easy to handle the airbrush needle is. Oh, and by the way, this is an old 0.51 from a cheapo Chinese-made airbrush that basically died on me years ago. Okay, I kind of forgot about the tracks, so let's have a quick look at what I did with them before we move on. After priming them in black, as you saw before, I sprayed the central tracks with AK Tracks Primer. Now, I would have done the same on the two tracks on the sides of the vehicle, but I didn't fancy complicating matters even more with masking and stuff, so I just decided to match the colors later through weathering. With the base coat now entirely done, it was time for a bit of careful masking again, followed by some more chipping fluid. Again, I pretty much flooded the area, knowing that the priority would be removing any red overspray that might happen. This acrylic red by Vallejo sprayed really well, but was far more transparent than I was expecting this time, so I had to apply several layers. Thankfully, there were no problems whatsoever with spider webbing or any blotchy spots, so I was happy enough. After that, I gave all the panels another pass with bloody red, which is one shade lighter. That still wasn't quite what I was looking for, but it was good enough for now. Now it was time for some more chipping. Taking the needle to the red panels was quite fun, even though I had to be a bit more careful, as acrylics can come away in big flakes rather easily. Whenever possible, I was looking to create a double layer chipping effect, so to speak, and I think I succeeded at that. Apologies for the shaky image, by the way. Now it was time for ammo track wash, starting with a pin wash on the side tracks, or whatever you call those. As you can see, getting this enamel to do its job through capillary action was very easy. Thanks to the generous coat of gloss varnish, that I had applied off-camera just prior to that. By the way, if you can use lacquer safely, I would recommend Tamiya X22, which always works great for me. Otherwise, again, I would go with a rattle can gloss varnish specifically designed for models. But back to the wash itself. I was quite happy with the effect I was getting here and not overly concerned about a few blotches here and there. As you can see, this model is beautifully detailed, and all those surface details and panel lines lend themselves very well to a pin wash, even if the model is not as easy to handle as, say, a more conventional vehicle. Now for the central tracks. Calling this a pin wash would be a bit of a misnomer, since I went with a very heavy application of the enamel. In this case, I just wanted to coat the entire section in a uniform fashion. I know this doesn't look like much right now, but I knew that the tracks would really come together in the next weathering stages. 
So in terms of pigments, I went for my trusty trio of rust pigments, which go from reddish brown to almost bright orange in color. Starting with the darkest one, called Track Rust, I liberally sprinkled the pigment, so to speak, and then used a sippling motion using makeup brushes in both cases. The idea was to concentrate on the tracks, as this represented the red sands of the environment, but also to let the pigment fall on adjacent areas, just as it would in real life. As you can see, I'm not exactly skimping on the pigments, nor am I being shy with my sippling. Now I have always said that the most important component for success with pigments is in the product and method that you use to fix them in place. In my case, I always go with an enamel-based pigment fixer, which works by capillary action, just like a pin wash. There are several other methods out there, of course, but if you're struggling to get your pigments right, try this one, it has never failed me. Right before the finish varnish, it was time for some graphite. These are solid graphite pencils, but any other pencil should do the trick. I went with an 8B this time, which is quite soft. The idea is to apply a dark metallic finish to areas which are rusty, but which have been polished through friction, like contact points on the tracks. As you can see, this is done by rubbing the graphite against a raised surface, which I find a nice and relaxing technique. Since I went with an 8B pencil, some graphite powder would deposit in adjacent areas. But in this case, I saw that random element as a plus rather than a problem. By the way, because this is a wargaming model, first and foremost, I knew that I would be applying a matte varnish after this, which always knocks down the effect quite a bit. So if you're also a wargamer, don't be shy. Now for the lenses, or shall we say the eyes of the model. First I picked the brightest metal paint I have, which is Speed Metal by Scale 75. I'm terrible at painting details and well, just at brush painting in general, but the idea as you can see is to apply a little highlight to the center. Then with Scale 75 Black Metal, I tried to create a darker area below and above our highlight. Finally, I chose the only acrylic wash that I still own, this Vallejo model wash, and applied a kind of pin wash around the rim. Once it was all dry, it was time for the real start of the show, Tamiya X27 Clear Red. Before applying it, I had dampened the brush slightly with AK Real Colors Thinner, but I did not thin the paint. Since I will admit that I was a little apprehensive about doing stuff like this on camera, I was far too conservative with a clear red trying to paint it, which I know very well is not actually what you should do. Instead, you should essentially deposit the paint into the recessed area and let it flow by itself, filling the cavity, so to speak. In the end, that's what I did, and I was happy with the results. With the lenses done, it was time to improve the red panels a little bit. Using my red oil brusher, I stippled some oil paint onto the center of the panels and then tried to blend it with a dry brush. I could have done this much better to be honest, but at this stage I just wanted to finish the model and get on with it. So what are my conclusions about this project? Well, first of all, I'm not entirely sure that painting the sub-assemblies has paid off in terms of the finish, but what it has done is allow me to explore what for me is an entirely new approach. Also, it has helped me hone skills like masking, which will come in useful for future builds. So yeah, I'm happy that I chose this more difficult route. Basing the model, which I did off-camera, was also a fun and interesting experiment. As a board gamer, I've really based hundreds of models, but with this one, I wanted to try techniques and products which I could transfer to future diorama builds. However, in the end, I could not spend as much time as I would have liked on it, because otherwise, well, <laughs> there would have been no video. 
I guess that's part of the paradox of being a modeling YouTuber, right? In any case, for the amount of time that I invested into this mighty snail tank, I'm quite proud of the results. As for the model itself, it is by far the most fitly that I've seen, in terms of construction, in the Star Wars Legion range. Having said that, I put together all the sub-assemblies with my 7-year-old son, so it's not like it's hugely complicated or anything. I'd say it's more laborious rather than difficult. If you're a Clone Wars fan, even if you don't play Legion, I would wholeheartedly recommend this model. If nothing else, it really is quite unique. Oh, and did I mention that the guns are completely articulated? My son loves that feature, as you may expect. All in all, this has been a very rewarding project for me, and I hope that you've all enjoyed this video, guys. Stay tuned for more hobby content at the Race for Terra. As always, I would like to thank all of my Patreon supporters. Your generosity helps me keep the lights on, and it makes a big difference to me. Thank you all, and remember, keep it up and weather it out.